to do with the concept of journey in one way or another. The appropriate place to begin with Nathan was with nothing. Nathan is imagining something that I don't know if it exists in the world anymore, which is a place on the map that has no indications, no knowledge, no nothing. With GPS, I just don't think this exists anymore. But uh, we were together in a program called Composing in the Wilderness last year in uh, Denali Park in Alaska. A couple of your New Zealand composers have been on that, Gemma Peacock and uh, Simon Eastwood, have both done that. And um, I, I get Nathan's vision, where, where we were, just looking at these vast spaces of seemingly nothing but beauty. Um, so some of our journeys are less pleasant. And uh, this next piece was written, uh, uh, was commissioned by a pianist in the United States named John McDonald for a collection that was called Common Injustices. Uh, I don't think I have to say anything more about the piece. You'll, you'll get that very quickly. Um, it's for electronics and piano. And it's, I, I adore that medium of the acoustic piano with the electronics. Um, I, I particularly enjoy the concept of music, I mean, uh, man with machine as opposed to man against machine. I think it's a, a healing thing that we can do. So here is this. between us who are 
those of us who are composing now and voices um, you know, earlier in the century um, who still speak to us and who still inform our composing. Um, I've done Hindemith and Stravinsky and Debussy in the past and now Janáček. Um, I adore the music of Janáček. I think uh, the way he uses his motives, which are often very quirky, and his harmonies, which are very quirky, uh, and yet infuses them with uh, such a sense of presence as to make them very, very personal and very intimate. And I think you find that in his big symphonic work as well as his small work. And on an overgrown path, his idea of this path was the path of life. So that's how it fits into our theme. He wrote two, two books of On an Overgrown Path. The first book, the pieces have all these incredible fanciful titles. The second book, uh, as shown in your program, are just um, tempo markings. So, hope you enjoy.
So one of the most intimate journeys is the one we can have with someone else, and that can take the form of a chat. And uh, your wonderful, uh, often composer, uh, Eve de Castro Robinson, has created what I think is just this perfect little gem of a piece. Um, I've been writing music for a little more than 40 years now, and I really appreciate when composers say what they have to say and then shut up. And sometimes that takes an hour, and sometimes that takes three minutes. And it's, the three minutes are not so easy, you know, when you to get a perfectly shaped piece. And uh, I think just, Eve just hits it right on the head with it. music, this piece might come as a little bit of a surprise. <clears throat> His groundbreaking music was written a good bit earlier than this. And uh, in a lot of ways, it's more extreme in terms of what he asks for the piano and what he asks for the performer. Uh, his original version of this was completely on the keyboard. I think he had a bunch of people saying, George, I like your music, but I don't want to do all that stuff. And uh, so he wrote this piece to be played completely on the keyboard, and then at, afterwards added things in that you can do inside, and I do most of them. Um, I, it's a very unusual piece for him because it's nine minutes of continuous rhythm, uh, a continued uh, eight, beat, eight note pulse, which I am not aware of in any of his other pieces. And um, uh, the processional he's describing is more a processional of nature rather than of any human kind. Um, and for me, this uh, consistent pulse sounds sometimes flowing, sometimes overwhelming, and sometimes it, uh, ecstatic. And uh, I think the 
The single-mindedness of this piece gives it a great deal of power.
our journeys, we get a little bit lost. And uh, I'm sure you're all aware of that wonderful volume of landscape preludes that was collected. Uh, I think Stephen DePledge was the pianist who was behind that, and uh, he got some of the best known or best admired or something composers in your country to write for him. And uh, Samuel Holloway's uh, Terrain Vague fits the title perfectly. He describes it as uh, a marginalized urban space. It's an actual architectural term. And his take on it is that it's a place that's liminal or transitional or interstitial. And you'll hear a little marker motif at the beginning uh, that repeat, uh, reappears several times, almost as a way of assuring us that we're not totally lost. But um, this piece has some of the most complex rhythms that I've ever encountered. And so it's sort of this shifting sands of pitch and rhythm, and you get a, just a little hint that you're not totally lost every now and then. Thank you. 
trip to Japan two years ago in November, and before I went, I had this inkling that I might hear stuff that I wanted to record. And so I bought a little handheld uh, recorder and I took it with me. And I got way more and way more interesting stuff than I ever thought I would. I got some natural things like waves and birds and these enormous ravens that just seem to be everywhere. Uh, I got actual instruments. Uh, all the shrines have bowls and gongs and uh, uh, temple blocks and things like that of all different kinds of pitches. And um, I happened to walk into certain things. I walked in, in a garden. There was a, an open air, no theater performance. I walked into that. There was a guy playing um, this sort of instrument, a metal instrument that you sort of rub on the street. I got that. And uh, um, I also got in a, I was in a temple. And there was, I hope this wasn't terribly indiscreet that I recorded it, but there was a priest chanting behind a screen, and I got that. Uh, and then the one thing that was planned, though, uh, when I was in Nara, there is a thousand-year-old huge bell that's there. And my guide told me, at 8 o'clock, they're going to ring this 16 times. I had to go. And so that's what ends the piece. It's a really, it's this enormous bell, and back in the day, it was what signaled the end of the day for people. So um, the, the piece is not like a snapshot of my trip. Like when you recollect any trip, you sort of have a piece from here and a piece from there, and then that piece tends to come back and, and that kind of thing. So the electronics in this um, both sort of provide uh, an emotional support and an emotional push, uh, as well as sometimes just sort of background. And at certain times, it, uh, it's an actual rhythmic underpinning to this. And uh, these performances in New Zealand are the premier performances of this piece.